meeting here. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things I would like to do as I do in all my classes is I've got two, they're really not rules, that's probably too strong a phrase, but there are two things that I would request of you. If you have a question, ask it. You know, let's, let's all learn from each other. If you're on Zoom, unmute yourself, ask the question. That's better than doing the chat thing. Uh, so what I, I would ask you to do that if you had a question, ask. The other thing is remember, I'm a very funny guy. So when I say something that at least you're sure I think it's funny, just out of courtesy, you need to laugh. I mean, that's just reasonable. Okay. Are you as funny as Dick Dillingham? Funnier. Okay. I'm funnier than Dillingham. Okay. Now, you know, Mike thinks he's in the running for the three funniest. He's not even close. And Mike, I know this is recorded. We've told you this before. I'm sorry. It's just how it is. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today, <clears throat> a number of different subjects, things that keep coming up. Uh, we'll talk about some aspects of the new contracts because what you have there is the new contract. Um, we're going to talk about the combination of the timing in the option period of the option fee and the earnest money and how that's really working is it's all going to the title company now and working through that. Uh, we're going to talk about the termination issues because we've had several transactions recently um, where, and we're having this happen a lot. We're having buyers terminate almost immediately. They get into a contract and we're just, they're gone. Um, and we're going to talk about the different aspects of that and what's required and what's not required. Because sometimes it may be your buyer who does that. And, and sometimes we think it's buy, well, sometimes we know it's buyers who are in multiple contracts. They've made multiple offers because they're tired of not getting a deal. And uh, we're, do you have the material, Ivan? I yeah. Okay, we have some right up, and we have some right up here. I printed my own. Well, aren't you good? So, yeah. Uh, so, so we're looking at that situation and look at what the rights of everybody has. Because sometimes our sellers feel like they've been ripped off and they say, hey, I should get the earnest money and maybe, maybe not. So we're going to, we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about that in relationship to the Mantra HOA addendum. What we've always focused on in that addendum is the first choice, A1, because that's the most common. But in this really strong market, when you've got a seller with a strong piece of property, multiple offers, you may want to seriously look at countering one of the other choices, two, three, or four. Uh, so we're going to talk about those and kind of see how, how that works through and deals with it. We're going to talk about the what we finally refer to as the appraisal addendum. Uh, we're going to talk about that and how it relates to the paragraph 2B of the third-party financing addendum property approval and see how those two kind of uh, operate in conjunction. Uh, one of the things we're also see happening in this uh, low inventory, multiple offer world is sellers are almost just automatically saying, well, I need a temporary residential lease for a day or a week or a month or whatever, and I need it free. Um, and that's happening a lot. So buyer and seller both, both agents need to understand the risk of that lease because there's a risk in that lease for both sides. And so we need to understand, uh, you know, how we do that and, and what's going on that we'll work through and do those situations. Any questions so far as we're going to get into the, the contract itself? Now, the first thing I want to, because I've had this question come up, when you look at the one to four family contract, upper right-hand column, you see the date, 11, 10, 2020. I've had agents say, well, where are the new contracts, Bob? Aren't the new contracts dated in February or March or something like that? That's the actual day of the Trek quarterly meeting last year where they approved this contract. Now it didn't become available for use until after their February meeting because a couple of forms were still wrong. Uh, but these forms are now voluntary, available for use. They're in DocuSign and Command. Um, I'm told that today they should be in zip forms. I haven't checked yet to see if they are and zip forms or not. But the new contract form with this date on it becomes mandatory April 1st. Right now it's voluntary, but we're seeing a lot of people use this new form. Um, and you know, so we can kind of work through that. Uh, so when you, when you get an offer, 
look up there, see what the date is, and you'll know what it is. Now, one of the one of the things on the new forms that is so dramatically different, when you look at the first page and you look at paragraph four, that's a whole different paragraph than what we had on the old one. So that should be an immediate, wow, that's a different contract form uh, because it deals with leases as, as opposed to dealing with disclosure, relationship, seller and buyer, and that kind of thing. Now, what we need to understand about paragraph four, it only applies if there's either a residential lease associated with the property or there's a fixture lease or there's a natural resources lease. If they're not any of those three, nothing happens in paragraph four. You just move on. But if it's in those, we've got two new addenda, residential lease addendum, fixture lease addendum uh, that are part of all this that you need to be familiar with and work through it. If you've got the seller, this kind of creates a nice, easy segue for you to have a conversation with your seller and say, okay, you have fixtures. You got any fixtures that are leased? Because since it's now in the contract, we should talk about it. And we should have always talked about it. But now, because it's in the contract, it's an easier conversation. You say, hey, we really need to be talking about this because right here, here it is. And so you'll have that conversation um, and work through it. On the buyer side, because it's in here, you'll need to make sure you get some good information from the listing agent. Do not fall into the trap. If the seller has, if they're using the Texas Realtor uh, sales disclosure notice or the Metro Tax one, it asks in there about certain things that are leased or owned. It asks about security systems and solar systems and things like that. Don't rely on that telling you whether there are fixture leases or not. Ask the questions. <clears throat> And if you're if they're using the Trek four page sell disclosure, there's no question at all in there about leases. So that's not in that sell disclosure. So if that's the one the seller is using, and he can legally use that, you know, our sellers, we prefer them to use the Texas Realty one. If you're using that, then you won't have any information on the seller in the sell disclosure notice about fixture leases or residential leases. It won't be there at all. So you need to work through that. Uh, so any questions on that? Yes, sir. I, uh, what's the deadline? Unmute yourself so we can oh, go ahead. Oh, my, my <laughs> I need to hear. Thanks. Uh, when does the, um, when is like the, the, the last day before you actually have to use, like everyone has to Okay, use. good question. Well, I would ask what's the last day we can still use the old one and have to use the new one to be March 31st. So starting March 31st, everyone has to So have to after March 31st, 11.59 p.m. So midnight and later on April 1st, you're supposed to use the new one. Now, because I'm pretty involved with track on a lot of different levels, what we're told unofficially <laughs> by track is to say, we understand sometimes you're in the middle of a transaction and you're going through the process and maybe you're using the old form or maybe you get a transaction that really starts on April 1st we're going to give you some latitude as long as the parties to the contract understand they've chosen to use the old one because Trek is not going to regulate the parties to the contract. There's so many significant changes in these contracts that depending on what's going on with the property, uh, it, you could be very negligent by not using the new one. So as you've got to sell or fix your leases or things of that nature or smart devices or whatever. Um, and, and if you're using the old one, uh, that option fee can still be paid to the seller, cannot be paid to the title company. If you're using the new one, it has to go to the title company. But Trek is going to give us a little latitude because what will always happen is you're in an ongoing transaction. You've been working on this for a week uh, and you go through the process and whoop, here it is a first and say, well, we got to revise the contract and change the contract. Well, Trek's not going to make you do that. You know, kind of move forward, but make sure buyers and sellers understand here's what we're doing. Here's how we're moving forward. Charlie, does that answer that question, Ivan? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's say that, that you have an offer working and it's on the only one. It's March 30th. Yeah. But, um, you have to let both parties know that affected March 31st at 1159 p.m. We have new, new contracts. Well, only your client. You don't have to let the other party know. It's not your job to educate the other side. It's only your job to protect your client when you get an offer. If you've got a listing and, and you get an offer on the 30th, 31st, you don't have to say, you know what, that's the old form. 
uh, because we're going to cross the line into April 1st, you really ought to use a new one. No. Remember, even when you get an offer on the wrong form, your absolute obligation is to present that offer to your seller and then have a discussion about the forms working through the process. What we're not going to make the seller do on the 30 or 31st is say, you know what, you're not going to accept this offer, you're going to counter. You've got to counter on the new form. If, if that new form doesn't really apply to this particular piece of property and the seller says, you know, I'm okay with the old form. It's a good offer. Let's work through it and let's do it. They can do that. We're not going to, Trek's not going to make them shift to the new form in that time frame. And where my question goes is, so the listing, the listing seller and broker, whatever, are fine with the older form. The buyer wants the new one. They make an offer on the new one. Are we already in contract? I'm sorry. Are we already in contract or is the buyer just making an offer? No, we're working. Okay, so we're working on it. And all of a sudden the buyer wakes up because his agent had explained to him, said, oh, you know what? I just learned there's a new form. I'd rather use the new form because I'd rather have that option for you sitting at the title company rather than with the seller. I, I like that better. Well, and what we need to do is we need to change that offering process. We're not in a contract yet, depending on where it is buyer can withdraw their offer on the old form and bring in a new offer on the new form. Now they can make that change. And the offering, you know, you've got that total control working through it. Just like a seller receiving an offer on the old form and you're in that process can counter with a counter offer on the new form. And so they can do that and then work through it. Now, one of the things that we have to keep in mind, if particularly because of the challenges on the buyer side, because of the low inventory, if the buyer begins to make these shifts and changes, how's it going to affect your offer? So soon you're looking at, you know, five or six offers and you got this buyer playing games with a contract for him. He says, yeah, we're already got him trouble this from day one. So let's take this offer over here. So you need to have the conversation with your buyer when they're going to do this, how it might affect things to work through it. Does that kind of answer that before I go to follow up yeah. question with yeah. Ivan? Yeah, that makes uh -huh. sense. Thank you. Yes, sir. So uh, I guess I, Kind of a little bit, but they moved the, the option thing right next to the earnest thing. Included in the earnest money. So we're about to go to paragraph five. If everybody's good with the first page, let's go to the second page of the new contract forms to paragraph five. And you'll notice it says earnest money and termination option. They've taken the old paragraph 23 and moved it to paragraph five. So paragraph 23, that's been renumbered. Paragraph 23 is now the same as we used to have paragraph 24. And I see a hand raised here. Yes, I have a question about that. Yes, ma'am. So and maybe I just don't see it because I'm not reading fast enough, but before in the paragraph where it talks about the termination option. Paragraph had, 23. Correct. You had a choice of will or will not be credited towards the sale. And that's a great that question. And, and here's an interesting point. And it's, it's interesting that you picked up on that. We have language in the new paragraph five with our main option fee that it's automatic that the option fee will be credited to the sales price. And previously you had a choice, but you don't have two boxes anymore. And, and part of that, I'm told, I wasn't in the meeting, but the broker lottery committee, which operates kind of off of a 5% rule, which means if it happens 5% or less time, there's no point in messing with it. They said, you know what? That choice is never made. Nobody ever says we don't want to credit the sales price, so let's just make that automatic. Well, I was reading through our Facebook page, like with all the things that are happening, and I was seeing that that was a trend with people wanting to win offers, and they were saying you can have. That's uh, exactly right, and I think that's a good negotiating strategy. But now, because it's there automatically, you would have to actually change it. Right. You'd have to change in your offer, and that could be that. That's well. That's a business detail. Paragraph eleven, special visions. Okay. That buyer and seller agree that the option fee will not be credited the sales price. Okay. That's simple. Okay. So it's by default now discredited. Not by default. The language is actually there. It says it. Okay. It actually it actually states it. Okay. okay so it goes to the sales price. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because when you look in paragraph A four, okay. A four, the last sentence, the option fee will be credited the sales price at closing. So that's an automatic. It's not a default. It's stated in the contract. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so that's, a, that's an important thing. But back to, I think, the start of Ivan's question, uh, we've combined and, and literally, essentially, everything in 23 is brought forward to five, except that part about the choice on crediting the option fee to the sales price. 
Now, uh, what has changed in this though, you know, we've got for both the earnest money and the option fee, we've got a three day time frame. And uh, we now have, you know, we had before in the earnest money on this three day time frame. If the third day falls on a weekend or legal holiday, it moves to the next day that's not a weekend or legal holiday. Well, we've never had that language for the option fee before, but we now do. So both the option fee and the earnest money fall under that thing that if the third day, and we get to the third day with calendar days, if that third day is a weekend or a legal holiday, we go to the next day. It's not a weekend or legal holiday. So the option fee that has to be paid in three days that's going to apply to that. So if, if you've got a contract and the contract, effective day of the contract is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, well, the option fee and the earnest money both move to Monday, unless Monday's a holiday. Yes, sir. So would that effectively give you two more free days for the option period? So let's say your option period is three days because you want to be competitive with your offer, right? And then so the third day falls on a on weekend. On the weekend, right? So, and you obviously can't terminate um, on the option fee if you haven't submitted it to the title company, right? If there's no well, there are some other factors. We're going to talk about that. Okay. But okay. now there's some interesting nuances to what you're saying as you brought this up. That just kind of gives you an extra option period day because you don't really have to bring it in. Now, here's an interesting thing we need to consider. Payment of the option fee does not determine the timing of the option period. The option period, the first day of the option period is the day after the effective day of the contract. So when a contract gets effective day of the contract is Wednesday, the option period starts on Thursday, regardless of when you pay the option fee. So option would still end on Saturday, regardless of if the money is delivered. Well, no, but yeah, yeah, the option period will end on the last, last day of that option period, 5 p.m. On that last day, whether it's a weekend legal holiday, the option period doesn't extend, but the timing for payment of the earnest money and the option fee will extend. But you wouldn't be able to terminate unless you submitted the money. Right? Well, okay, so he, he brought up again, so let's go ahead and address it. Wait, am, I, am I wrong though? No, so he, what, he's, what he's essentially asking, he says, you can't terminate until you pay the option fee. Yeah. That is if you're going to terminate under the, term, under the termination option. Yeah. What if you're terminating under the mantor HOA? You haven't got, well, yeah. You're in contract. Yeah. It's in a mantor HOA. Okay. You checked off A1 on the HOA addendum. Sure. From day one of the contract, the buyer can terminate. And then for three days after receiving it or closing whichever comes first. So the reality is you can have a contract and the buyer can have termination rights and never pay an option fee and never deliver earnest money. Right. That wouldn't get you very light in the, but yeah, okay, I got you. I mean, and, and, and one of the things that I, and I, I'm kind of pushing this a little bit, we just had this, right? Oh, okay. We just had this. And, and our agent had the seller and the buyer terminated. Never paid an option fee, never paid the earnest money. And we're, when we get to, you know, the timing of, in fact, we'll talk about it now because it's actually part of paragraph five and it's the earnest money issue. The buyer has three days and we just talked about that and get the earnest money to the title company. If the buyer doesn't get it in those three days, seller can send notice to the title company, can terminate the contract as long as they've terminated before the buyer delivers the earnest money right. and while there's still a contract. Now, here's, here are two important points. All days of the contract, except for the option period, are full days, which means 11.59 p.m. Now, the misunderstanding that we had in one situation is because the earnest money is being delivered to the title company, a title company told our agent, oh, 5 p.m. That's the end of business. You've got to have that earnest money to us by 5, by 5, by 5 p.m. Well, not all title companies close at 5 p.m., by the way. So but that's the time frame. And the buyer and the title company attorney even said, yeah, that's right. It's close of business. Well, it's not close of business. It's 11.59 p.m. 
And the reality is, and, and we've actually had this happen. One of our agents didn't get the earnest money to the title company in three days, recognized their mistake, and, and she did make a mistake. And it was the last, it was the third day, and it was passed when the title company was closed. She was able to contact someone at the title company, met them at 10 o'clock at night, and delivered the earnest money. Now, in the situation I just talked about that just happened last Friday, the sellers, you know, well, past 5 p.m., past the title company's closed, you didn't lose earnest money, we're going to terminate. Well, no, you're not. You don't get to terminate until midnight of that fourth day, which is the a.m. of that fourth day. You don't get to terminate. You've got to give that buyer three full days. You don't give them three full days, the seller doesn't have a right to terminate. Got to work through that process. So it's important to recognize the timing of this, the number of days, what that means, and when the seller has these rights of termination. Question on that? Is that uh, are we kind of semi-good with that? So, um, double checking on that. So, who is this? Uh, this is Addison McKissick. How are you? <laughs> um, so, pretty much just summarizing that to make sure that I have it. If the money oh, is yeah. delivered by like 12 p.m. after that third day, the seller can then terminate. 12 p.m. is noon of the next day. <laughs> so, if you're talking about 12 a.m. midnight. Yes. Okay, so ask the question again with 12 a.m. midnight. What's your um, question? Yes, so just double checking. So if the money, uh, the uh, earnest money and the option fee are not delivered by 12 a.m. on that like beginning of that fourth day of the effect of the um, option period, the seller yes. can go to the title company and terminate it? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yep, absolutely. Now, we get into all kinds of logistic challenges. As a general rule, even the best title companies out there aren't open at midnight. So you can send it over, and you've got the timeline of the notice by email. So you've got that timeline. And when they get into the office at 8 o'clock and they see it, uh, even if the buyer at 8.05 has delivered the option, the earnest money, it's too late. If the seller sent a termination notice over before the buyer delivered the earnest money. So it's going to get to be an important timing situation, which means you want good documentation. Ivan? Did that, did that answer the question there? Are we good? My Zoom person? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh huh. Ivan? You know, in the past, sometimes people would Venmo the option money to the seller. They would what? They would Venmo it or direct it. Yeah, sure. So, I'm assuming with this change, that is no longer possible unless the title company has a... Okay, so Ivan is asking about the manner of delivery, whether you can do it electronically or Venmo or, or whatever different ways. That's going to depend on the ability of the title company to receive those. Okay. Some title companies will be able to and some won't. So when you're working a transaction, you need to know what the title company's process is, what are their procedures. Okay. Uh, but the actual manner of delivery of that is not addressed in the contract. It's just I got to do the delivery, so so there'll be some some kind of changes there. You see that creating some more problems? No, actually, I don't. I, I think moving forward, the technology of the manner in which we do that, uh, I think that's just going to happen. It's going to happen more and more uh, as people work through that. Uh, we we really are moving more away from agents getting the car and driving over and dropping something off and doing it electronically. I would don't you think that's kind of where we're going? I mean, personally, I would hope that you could deliver both the earnest and the option electronically because it, so what if you as an agent can't deliver it or pick it up for your clients? And then it means your clients have to take time off of work to go deliver during business hours, right? But if they can go log into their, their JP Morgan Chase account, right? So in, and so in this case, when you've got a derelict, irresponsible, lazy agent right. who won't do that because they have a volleyball tournament to go to, that happens. That happens. <laughs> it happens a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll see it. Well, but, but, so, and you know, but the challenge is, you know, things happen and we understand that. And if there are other alternatives or ways to get that money to a title company, then that's certainly we need to be considering that. We need to consider, but you're going to have to check with the title company and say, what is it that you're willing to accept? Uh, because the title company is going to control that as you work through it. 
plus there's a digital footprint with that, right? Because do what? Like it says whenever you send the money, right? Like on your bank account, there's a digital footprint. So there's no, well, we lost the So you've got right? good documentation. Right. See exactly. that you've done it. It's sure. Yeah. And nothing could ever go wrong with technology. I've never it's seen it's always thing. going to be correct. I've never seen a single thing go wrong. So we're good. We're good. Really good idea. Now let's talk about the combination of the earnest money and the option fee, because in paragraph five a, it allows us, it allows the buyer to pay the earnest money and the option fee in two separate checks or combine in one amount. Either way. Now. Here's our challenge. Let's say you have 2,000 earnest money and $250 option fee. And the buyer says, well, yeah, I like doing one check. And so he makes a check for $2,000 and sends it over. They forgot the option. Well. But what did you forget? The did you forget the option? Or okay. Price? Well, the contract resolves that oh. because it actually establishes in here that the money will be first credited to the option fee and then to the earnest money. And because it goes to the option fee first, in this case, the option fee would be credited. We, we did that, but there's only $1,750 goes towards the earnest money, which means the buyer hasn't satisfied the requirement of the earnest money, which means if we don't catch it, seller can terminate the contract. So it's gonna be absolutely critical or the agent when they've got the buyer to make sure that amount is correct. Now, most of the good title companies I've talked to, I, and I asked them directly, I says, so when you receipt that contract and that earnest money, are you going to read the contract and see how much the earnest money and the option fee are and make sure that check you get is the correct amount? Are you gonna do that? Now, the good title companies I've talked to says, yes, we'll do that. Now. They're pretty busy up front. People probably don't understand how much those people up front do. And so they might miss it. So we can't miss it. We've got as an agent, when you've got the buyer, you've got to make sure that's exactly the right amount. Cynthia? Yeah. So when, when they make this one payment to the title company, that's, and let's say everybody does it right, everybody knows what they're doing, it goes incorrectly. It's $2,000 mm -hmm. and then $200 option. In. Uh -huh. So then when... How much time is the drag between the title company writing the check to the buyer? I'm assuming the title right, company- What do you mean about writing checks to the buyer? I mean to the seller. I'm sorry, I said the seller. Okay. So, so then the title company accepts the money and then writes a check to the seller? Why? For the option? Why? I don't, I'm assuming that the, the seller- Okay, so- anyway. Okay, so- So they never get it? Well, uh, we address that and oh. here, here's our challenge. And this is going to be according to procedures of the different title companies. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that we have a conversation about here and, and dealing with this is you've got a seller and there's a $250 option fee. Uh, and the way it works in now, you know, they get that money as it works through the process. Uh, however, the reality is um, if it's being paid to the title company, then they're sitting there and going through the process and he said, well, hmm, where, where is it? Well, it's at the title company. The seller says, well, I'd like to have it. This is going to get to the policy of the title company and what they're willing to do. While in the, in the document, in the contract, it gives the title company the right to uh, without further notice of consent from the buyer, and you see this in, in 5A4, they have a right to deliver this option fee to the seller. So title company has accepted an off a contract, they got the earnest money, they've got the title company, $250 option fee, and they're sitting with it. Uh, and the procedure that virtually every title company I've talked to says, I said, well, what are you gonna do with it? It says, we're gonna hold it to closing. And then it'll show, and in closing, it'll be addressed because it'll be a line item be created to the sales price. I said, well, what if the seller wants it? Okay. Then our problem happens is how does the title company get that money to the seller? Now, we know the title company's preference for sending money to anyone is what? The wire funds. That's their norm. First of all, because they can do it for free. They've got millions in the bank. So the bank says, yeah, whatever you want to wire, not a problem. You can do it all day long. 
So that's the norm, but you're not going to wire $250 to a seller because the seller, in most cases, their bank's going to charge them. So they're, well, well, how come I don't get $250? I get $230 because my bank charge will be $20 for wiring funds. What's working there? So what's going to probably happen is a title company says, well, we'll cut a check and it'll be at our office and the agent or the seller can come pick it up. Now we're going to have a time lag and it's going to be probably about 10 days because of the good funds rule. The title company is going to require these be good funds. They're going to make sure that's exactly right. So, you know, we're not going to cut a $250 check to the seller until we know this money from the buyer is good. And so the seller is going to say, I don't get it immediately. Now they get it immediately now. Now the seller still has the same problem now, making sure that check and buyer is good, but they've got it. And they go take it, deposit in their bank or cash or whatever. But now they're going to have to wait for the title company to go through that good funds process and deal with that. So, the, so here's the key. If you've got the seller and you get an offer on the new form, you need to kind of ask the seller says, here's how this works now. Is this a problem for you? Do you want that money really early on? You want it pretty quickly uh, as you go through the process. Now we don't, we won't have a chance. You know, you can't change who the, who the money's going to go. Well, I want it to go to me. Well, if you use the f good new form, you can't go to the seller it has to go to the title company. And so the seller says, well, that's rotten. I don't, I don't like that. Well, that's how it is. I mean, that's what the new form is doing. Most sellers won't care. Most sellers don't look to the option for you as money that they're going to get right now and go out and buy lunch. And once in a while you'll get a seller who says, well, where's the money? I want the money now. Then you're going to have to talk to that title company and say, what's your procedure? How do we deal with that? How are we going to do it? Now, the buyer is not going to care. I says, I, I don't care who I make the check out to. Seller, title company, doesn't matter. You know, whoever it is, it doesn't, it's okay. Uh, in fact, most buyers are going to say, I like that the option for you is at the title company. Because that way when we close, I know it's going to be taken care of. I don't have to worry about the seller remembering it, I guess. So that's good. So most buyers are going to be fine with this new rule. And certainly the agent said, yeah, I'd much rather take it to the title company than have to locate the listing agent or whatever. But, if you, but you need to at least have your seller, help your seller understand that title, that option fee is going to the title company and there's going to be a procedure there. You want it right away. Here's what we're dealing with. So they at least know that's kind of what's going on. That makes semi-sense. Zoom folks, do you have any questions? Do you want to unmute yourself as we've gone through the early part of this? Yes, Bob, this is Christina Gorley. Hello, Christina. If the contract uh, falls through and the option has already been paid to the title company, uh -huh. is there any issue like there sometimes is with earnest money for the buyer to receive their option feedback? Okay, it's a good question. If you look at paragraph 5B of the contract, and, and it talks about that uh, termination, and then whatever that, you know, the option fee will not be refunded, uh, and escrow agent should release any option fee remaining with escrow agent to seller and any earnest money be refunded to buyer. So if the deal falls apart and the title company sitting there with, with the uh, uh, earnest money, I get the the option fee. This particular situation, nothing goes back to the buyer in situation. You know, earning, but the option fee, uh, the title company can now release the option fee to the seller. You have have that down in an A four, uh, and they don't need permission from the buyer to do it. So at that point in time, still have that same challenge with how they're going to get the money to the seller. But if this deal falls apart, whatever option fee the title company is holding goes to the seller. They say you work it out with the seller. How do we get you that $250? Thank you. Uh-huh. You're welcome. Uh, yes, ma'am. I wonder how much the escrow fees are going to go up at the title companies. Okay. So the question is, escrow fees may go up at the title company. Uh, escrow fees in Texas are regulated by a Texas Department of Insurance. And the title company would have to show... Uh, and, and their procedures, extra costs that justify higher escrow fees. They'd have to actually apply to the Texas Department of Insurance for higher fees. And that's frankly a, a fairly challenging process, time consuming process. It'd have to be a significant amount. I mean, just like the rates change every four years or so on how much the title insurance policies are. 
and they have to show that because of their losses and their claims, they need a higher rate, or if their claim drop, they, the rate goes down. So I, I don't try to, I don't really see that happening. The escrow fee, I mean, like the top, what the title company charges, okay. as well as you would disperse from yep. all that. Yep. They're going to have to be doing more work. Well, it seems like. And, and I don't think they're going to use that more work uh, as an excuse. I think they're going to use the fact that they're doing a great job, more work to attract customers. Uh, I, I don't see this as something you're going to say, well, you know, it's a lot of work here, so we're going to have to charge you more. There's so much competitive competitiveness from one title company to the other that any title company whose fees begin to go up, people are looking at that. They'll say, well, I'm not going to use ABC title because their fees are double what they are over here. And I get the same service. So I don't, I really don't see that happening. I could be wrong. About it, the title no, they do. Well, in Dallas, Fort Worth, it's a mix. In the rest of the state, most of the title companies pushed this change. Because frankly, they were already taking the option fee. They were already doing it. They just need to contract to go along with what they were already doing. Uh, but in, in Dallas, we were doing it right according to the contract. And so Tyler can say, you know, this really is some extra work, but, but there is a language in here that releases the title company from liability. And they say, you know, so I, I think it's gonna be one of those things that we're going to adjust over time. Uh, we're pretty clear that as new contracts become prevalent uh, and they're used certainly after April 1st, um, we're going to see some adjustments. We're going to see some problems. We're going to see some challenges, things we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and we're confident that Trek, Broker Lawyer Committee, that they'll look at it and see if they need to make some changes, whatever. Broker Lawyer Committee is not meeting again until in June because they always wait till the legislature gets out of session before they meet again. So if anything's going to happen, it'd have, it'd happen much later. But we're going to need at least a good six months, maybe a year's worth of trial with a new form to see if there's something that keeps happening. We say, wow, we hadn't thought about that. We gotta make some changes. Uh, we're pretty clear there'll be test cases, but we're also clear of what? We don't wanna be the test case. So we know there will be, but we just don't wanna be it. So it works good. So are we good with paragraph five? Does everybody kind of say, yeah, that makes good sense. We're good with that. Uh, now, here, here's my, here's a little concern that I have. If you combine the earnest money and the, the title and the option fee, one amount, chances are pretty good that you're going to be very diligent and get it to the title company in three days. So you're good. If you're going to do it in different amounts, one of our challenges is sometimes people will get the earnest money in because they don't want the seller to be able to term the contract, but they don't necessarily get the option fee in time. And so I can see the way this is set up with the way this is going now. And it addresses us, you know, down in, in 5D about the option fee. Um, if the buyer doesn't get the option fee in time, all that happens is they don't have a termination option. They're not in default, doesn't affect the contract. Buyer just doesn't have that termination option. They still have any other rights termination, financing, major HOA, sales disclosure. They have any other rights termination. They just don't have it under the termination option. That's all that's happened there. Now, if the buyer doesn't get the earnest money there in time, in addition, you know, it gives the seller that ability to terminate the contract, but it also gives the seller the ability to go to paragraph 15, the default paragraph, and make a choice there against the buyer. So technically, a buyer could get sued for not delivering the earnest money in time. The option fee, no big deal. I just don't have a termination option. Well, no big deal. I got them all these risks. I, I don't care. Uh, so earnest money and the option fee are two different ball games. We good? Questions on any of this? Go through any of that. Um, now, I, uh, I I want us to, and I, I guess I need to, uh, Use this in uh, go down so the people who are on the Zoom. I apologize, Zoom folks. I have I didn't scroll down on the contract as you're looking at it on Zoom. So let me work on that. Um, Bob, I think it's on Lori's screen. 
No, I've got it up here too. Well, has she is she moving it around? I mean, I've got it here uh, on the laptop here. Hmm? You can scroll on the side over there, can't you? Yeah. All right, let me get my mouse, my scroll thing over here to it. Okay. Um, so we did, we did paragraph five there. Um, we've talked before, I, unless you've got some questions, I don't necessarily... I don't necessarily want to go into the smart devices unless somebody has questions. We've had three classes on this and we've touched on them uh, in smart device, which is paragraph 10. Again, this is one of those things that we should always have been talking about anyway, mm -hmm. but in paragraph 10B, paragraph 10 possession, 10B smart devices, it addresses uh, the smart devices and the uh, thing for the seller. The only point I do want to make if you've got a sell seller who has smart devices, uh, he needs to understand he's going to have to give up passwords and things like that for control of this. What we're encouraging them to do is change at the very beginning their passwords so that they may be using passwords they use on other things. Put in unique passwords to just this so when they give them up to the buyer, they're not giving up any of their other information. So they kind of work through that. Uh, so let's go into we're having in the uh, third party financing which should be our next form our next form here um, we're still having some challenges and, and this kind of works a little bit in conjunction with uh, the appraisal addendum. In fact, we just, just had this earlier. Uh, I had this morning I had a call from my Rockwell office where they've got the listing and the buyer, it's an FHA buyer. And the FHA buyer wants to put language in special provisions where um, they'll pay so much more than the appraised value, which the FHA rules say a buyer can get out of the deal if it doesn't appraise with the sales price. And so our challenge here is most of our most of the attorneys we've talked to say we don't know if that language and special provisions prevails over the FHA rules. We think that push come to shove towards the end if the buyer all of a sudden say, you know, I don't think I want to do this. And FHA says I don't have to do this. We think they can still get out. Uh, so if the seller wants, in, in this case, seller had multiple offers. If seller wants to accept that one, uh, and they kind of were looking at it because it was more than any of the others, about 30000 uh, then they need to talk to a good real estate attorney and get some advice on the risk they're taking uh, because it does get to be a little bit of a challenge because FHA VA rules say, buyer, you can be losing anything. If it doesn't appraise through the number you've got in that paragraph four, you get out of the deal. Um, and so, you know, that... In that particular situation in paragraph four, uh, where you've got a number in there that's typically of the sales price, then appraise for that, buyer can get out of it. Now, I do I do want us to be able to uh this is where it'll move again. The uh, the mentor HOA. I, I do want us to look at the other three choices. We should be really familiar with A one because right now that's the dominant choice. A one of the HOA denim, which you should have in your packet, should be right after the third party financing addendum. The seller, it's at the seller's expense to provide the HOA doc, including the resale certificate. And once the buyer receives it, it's got three days to terminate for any reason or closing whichever comes first. One of the important things that somehow keeps getting missed 
because in my opinion, it does say it, but it maybe it could be clearer. If you look in A1, and that last sentence starts on the fourth line, if buyer does not receive the subdivision information, buyer is buyer's sole remedy, may terminate the contract at any time prior to closing, and the earnest may be refunded to buyer. What this means is any time before the buyer receives it, which includes the very first day the buyer and seller are in a contract. Because at that point in time, chances are the buyer doesn't have the, the docs, including the resale certificate. So we have a contract, executed contract that morning, that afternoon, buyer says, no, nope, I'm out of here. They can terminate under the HOA because they haven't received it yet. You say, well, I don't even have received it. It hadn't even been ordered. It doesn't matter. They haven't received it. They can terminate immediately. And that's what A1 does. It's a powerful right of termination. Now, when you've got the seller in a strong piece of property and you have multiple offers are expected, when you get offers with A1, your seller may say, well, let's consider maybe two or three. Now, two is a really interesting, unique animal. I don't even know how they came up with the language in two. It's Because in two, the buyer is going to obtain the HOA information. Now, they're going to go through the title company to do it because HOAs don't want to hear from anybody but the title company. But the buyer obtains it, buyer pays for it, and delivers it to the seller. Now, if the buyer obtains the information uh, within the time required, however many days there, they may terminate contract within three days after buyer receives it. Remember, the buyer's going to receive it, they're going to pay for it, and they're going to send it to the seller. Now, there's interesting language here. If buyer, due to factors beyond buyer's control, is not able to obtain the subdivision information within the time required, buyer may as buyer so remedy, terminate the contract within three days after the time required or prior to closing, whichever occurs first, there's may run into buyer. Now, the challenge here is it implies that this only is a right for the buyer if they couldn't do anything about it. The buyer just says, you know what? I tried to get the information. I tried to get the HOA docs. Couldn't do it. The HOA wasn't available. The HOA wouldn't talk to me. Uh, just couldn't do it. I, I, not my fault. I did everything I could, couldn't do it. So if that's the case, then once we pass this time frame in here, buyer and terminate. And what it means, what it seems to mean, and it's not good language, but it, what it seems to mean is a buyer just changes their mind and says, well, I want out of this. That's not really, not really what it says. You've got to try. You've got to try to obtain it. You've got to show it was beyond your ability to obtain it then you've got some termination rights. You don't get to just change your mind and say, well, I'm going to use this excuse. If, if A2 is checked off, we don't think the buyer has that. Now, A3 deals with the buyer has received it and approved it. But there's a little thing thrown in here, and it's an updated resale certificate. It may be that on this particular deal, the resale certificate is, is three, four, five months old because resale certificate is good for six months or 80 days. So it may be old and buyer says, well, I want, I want an updated resale certificate. Well, <clears throat> seller at buyer's expense shall deliver to buyer within 10 days after receiving payment for the updated resale certificate, which means buyer's going to have to pay the seller. Buyer may terminate this contract and there's may refund to buyer if seller fails to deliver the update resale certificate within the time required. Now, there's a little bit of a gap in here. If the buyer says, yeah, I want an updated resale certificate, and we understand that seller doesn't get around to doing it in the 10 days, what if seller does deliver the, the updated resale certificate to the buyer in the time frame? Does the buyer have any termination rights? No. Nope. Not under A3. Seller delivered in the time frame required. Buyer says, great, but you know what? There's some stuff on this updated certificate I don't like. Well, too bad. You don't have any right to terminate because that's not included in there. I think it probably meant to be, but, but it's not. And so seller says, you know what? I've already ordered up 
fact, I knew this was going to be a hot piece of property. I didn't want to give a buyer any rights termination. We've got all the docs into the resale certificate. We've already sent it over to the buyer. So we're not accepting any offer except for A3. If A3 is not checked off, we're not accepting. Now, aggressive seller can take the next step and go to four. Buyers are not required to deliver the subdivision information. Some buyers say, I don't want to mess with that. In fact, we're just moving from one house to the other in the subdivision. In fact, last year I was president of the association, of the, so I, I don't care. I don't need it. What's going to happen, though, is the company says, well, we need a resale certificate. And that's addressed in paragraph D. Who's going to pay for that? I actually had this come up because we, um, and, and we were going to check them before. I had a buyer that um, offered on a property um, in a neighborhood that had a big HOA. We were all the way, had gotten the HOA certificate, and then it didn't appraise. And my buyer chose to walk away because the seller wasn't anyway. So we terminated, but then we put another offer in another contract and another house in that same neighborhood. And, and you already had that information. She said, I don't need the information, but then I wasn't sure. I was, I, so we were going to put that on there, but then I wasn't sure how it was going to affect once we got to where we had to have it for the resale for title. So, yeah, like, so and did the first one. Again. So Cindy brought up a situation in a subsequent transaction. Her buyer already had the HOA information, including a resale certificate from a previous transaction and was considering checking off four. She doesn't need it. So what she needs to be aware of is in paragraph D, of that addendum, if the title company requires it, which they generally will, then we need to check off the box who's going to pay for it. Oh. And that way you can, you can, the buyer can check off four and then check off whatever choice they're going to make in D of who's going to pay for it because the title company is going to require one. Okay. And so that's how so you that's handle how that. I should have done it. Yeah, that's how you could have done it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what did you check off A1 I just then? Did A1 again because yeah. I wasn't, okay. I could. I couldn't but now, you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So now you see yes. that if you've got a okay. seller, particularly a seller who's going to make, a, he's got multiple offers and he's going to make a counter offer, sure. he needs to consider something other than A1. Right. And he's look at the possibilities of how A2 or 3 or 4 can help it, help the uh, client. Because a listing agent in this situation with a house the buyer finally bought could have said, well, you know what? Well, no, you don't need it. You've already got this information. Check off four, and then we'll just check off who's going to pay for it in D. And you want to address that. So a listing agent could have come up with that, but they didn't think about it either. Um, people people aren't going to think through the nuances of that. Yeah, that's a lot. Yep. Yeah, I just didn't understand the verbiage. But now you do. Yes, I do. Now we do. Any questions from our Zoom folks on uh, HOA addendum and the rights of term? I trust me on this. I cannot overstate this. This is a free option period. This is a powerful right of termination. If you've got A1 checked off, this buyer can walk for any reason until they receive it and three days after receiving it or closing, whichever comes first. Powerful right of termination. And many of these HOAs are taking their sweet time because they're just, you know. Yeah. And, and so you end up. Five with, days. Huh? So you can, can move along here. But the HOA will deliver them in 14 days. Yeah. They charge you a, they charge you a, charge you a rush fee. fee. They're charging it's rush fees on 10 day deals. Oh, yeah. It's a yeah. Very high number. Yeah. So we need to really work through that. So when you've got a seller and you see it's a strong piece of property, you need to be working on this right away. I mean, just right away. So that, you're, so that your seller is in a position to check off, accept and offer something other than A1. That makes semi sense. Uh, okay, now to uh, to everyone's favorite addendum, and I say that with a uh, huge tongue in cheek, is what we finally refer to as the appraisal addendum, and it's and and in your packet, you've got a five page document where I've explained the appraisal addendum plus a two-page supplement <laughs> for, for situations that the addendum doesn't work for. <laughs> I could, well, because what happened is there were too many situations where the addendum didn't work. So I said, well, let's look at some other ways we can do this. Uh, now, first thing, in spite of the fact that buyers and agents are still doing it, they're making an FHA offer and using this addendum. Cannot use this addendum for 
anything other than a conventional loan, period, in a conversation, only a conventional. Now, this addendum has two primary sections. One, it has a waiver section, which is choice one or two, and then it has an additional right to terminate, which is three. Now, what sellers are wanting to look for is some protection for the appraisal issue. They're looking at five offers and say, we want to make sure that if it doesn't appraise, and, and in many cases, they're accepting offers way above list price, it's probably not going to appraise. They say, you know what? We want to make sure our this buyer, if we accept their offer, they're going to cover the gap. Either totally cover the gap or cover part of the gap. And so your seller is looking for A1 or A2. Now, A1 is a total waiver. Buyer says, let's pretend the appraisal is not even an issue because that's what A1 means. Um, and you, as you go through that, um, what the listing agent better do is check source of funds. You need to make sure, talk to the buyer's lender. They're going to say, it doesn't matter what it appraises for, we'll cover the gap. Ask the lender, says, can they do that? If they got funds beyond the reserves required, money to do that. Uh, because a seller needs to know that that can happen. The second one is buyer says, I'll just cover part of a gap. Not the whole thing. I'll just do some of it. Uh, in that particular situation, the uh, the way you do this, and let's just use it. And in my document, by the way, my five-page document, I have actual examples. I have sales prices. I have dollar amounts. They kind of explain how it is. But let's say you've got a four hundred thousand dollar sales price. We don't care about the list price. All we're looking at is paragraph three C of the contract, the sales price. So $400,000 sales price. Buyer says, I'll cover $10,000 worth of appraisal gap. If it appraises for $390,000 or more, I'll cover the gap. Hello, Chance. We just had Celebrity walk in. Uh, do you guys remember Chance? Do you know he's back with us? He... <laughs> See, you're a celebrity. She didn't know you were gone. That's a good thing. Oh, well. But, but he's back. He's back. Back from Oklahoma. You got it. You got your shots. Pass. You got your trash. Forward. Okay. Uh, and we have paperwork up here. Uh, hey, we have paperwork. You want to get paperwork because we're going through some stuff. Okay. So here's the key. In my example, $4,000 sales price. Fire says I'll cover a gap of up to $10,000. And we're on the appraisal addendum now, which is in your packet. Thank you. What you would, the number the buyer would put in here is 390,000. So if it appraises for 390,000 or more, buyer's gonna make up the difference between that appraised value and the sales price. If it appraised for less than 390, buyer gets out of the deal. What buyer can really do is start renegotiating with the seller. So that's, so what you look at is whatever the appraisal gap the buyer says is covered, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, you subtract that from the sales price, that's the number you put in to double I. And that's how that is. Now, the additional right determination is a strange animal. And the only, the only rationale that I can come up with for a buyer to use it is they're making a large down payment and they won't control over what the lender does. So $400,000 sales price, but the buyer's putting 200,000 down, borrowing $200,000. It appraises for 390. Lender says, price for 390, $200,000 loan, we'll do that all day long, not a problem. I said, no, 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 no. It appraises for less sales price, I don't wanna do the deal. Well, if he's checked off the third box, buyer's in control. He puts the right numbers in there, buyer says, I'm gonna terminate, I don't care what the lender does, I'm terminating the contract. It puts the buyer in control of the deal. Now, if the buyer terminates under this provision, he's got a certain number of days to do it. So the appraisal has got to be done in no time because he's got to give the appraisal, copy the appraisal to the seller and then terminate under this. So the only rationale that I see for a buyer using the third box is a large down payment and they're concerned with what the lender is going to do. And they want to make sure they're in control of that. Questions on that? Zoom persons, questions on the addendum itself. Now, let's look at the juxtaposition. I get word? 
I bet they don't use that a lot in Oklahoma. No, nope. no. So let's look at the relationship between property approval in paragraph 2B of the third party financing addendum and this addendum. All this addendum addresses is the appraisal. And that's it. 2B, property approval, third party financing, addresses all lender underwriting requirements, including the appraisal. Now, appraisal is the one we normally look to, but it could be insurability, it could be repairs, it could be title issues, it could be anything else. So if there's not an appraisal issue, if the buyer has waived, checked off the first box, and they waive their appraisal, but the appraisal comes in fine, the buyer hasn't given up any other rights to terminate based on lender's unright requirement, based on the other requirements. So if he's got a problem with lender required repairs, he can still terminate because this doesn't address that. The appraisal addendum only addresses the appraisal, not anything else. So the buyer still has those rights to terminate. He also still has, under paragraph 2A of the third party finance addendum, rights to terminate based on buyer approval. This doesn't affect the buyer approval. So none of that works into that. So it's important to see as you have those two situations, how they affect each other as you work through that. Everybody semi good with that? Sure. Zoom persons, you have any choice, any uh, questions on this appraisal addendum, which is very clear and an understandable addendum. And I, I can't believe that you'd have any questions, but just on the off chance, Anyone might, I would certainly entertain it. Just, Bob, this is Christina yes, again. Just to make sure I'm clear, if they select the box above uh, 2B that says this contract is not subject to buyer obtaining buyer approval, then the seller is still in a good position, correct? Yeah, if you've got, and so the addendum that, that Christine's talking about is a third party financing addendum. Oh, yes. And it's ironic. We just had this happen. And, and it, it's going to be a very bad situation. And I'm trying to get all the documentation together because it's head, I think it's head toward a lawsuit. Oh. We've got a buyer. We had the buyer. And the buyer checked off on the second page of the third party financing addendum. Right above paragraph B, property approval, you got a box. They checked off the box. This contract is not subject to buyer obtaining buyer approval. So the buyer approval contingency is totally gone. This buyer had also checked off A1 of the appraisal addendum. Mm -hmm. So he had no appraisal protection. He had no buyer approval protection. It would take some other underwriting requirements to come into play. So when you check off that box there, uh, right above paragraph B on the second page, it takes out the contingency for buyer approval. Now, in, when you've got a competitive situation and your buyer is financially incredibly strong and your buyer says, you know what? There's no risk of my buyer approval. In fact, I could pay cash if I had to. So the buyer could make this a better offer by checking off that box. Mm -hmm. Buyer approval contingency, not part of the deal. I'm lock solid, I'm gold. So when sellers looking at different buyers say, well, this buyer doesn't need buyer approval contingency. This buyer is solid gold. This is buyer is good. Now, as a list gate, you're going to want to talk to the lender. Is this buyer really good or is he just even blowing smoke here? What's going on? <laughs> so you need to work through that. But that can be a way for a buyer to improve their offer by taking that contingency out and working through that. So good question, Christine. If you put that in there, that's a contingency that's gone and that might improve that buyer's offer. Now, sometimes when you do things like that and improve an offer, you have to explain it to the listing agent. Yeah, I'm, the listing I'm, the agent listing, our classes. I'm the listing agent on that particular one. Okay, so if they've got that in there, you see how that's better for your seller. Yes. Yeah, now you're still gonna wanna talk to the buyer's lender. I already make did. Make sure it's real. Yes. And, and there are reasons why the buyer's checking that off. Now, it, it won't count for FHA or VA. FHA and VA is not going to let the buyer uh, waive that contingency. It's only going to work on a conventional. We good? Is that? Yes, thank you. Can you help with that, Christine? Yes. Okay. Charlie has a question. Okay. I have seen recently, probably two or three times on offers I've gotten, paragraph 2A 
of the third party financing, the zero in there. Yeah. So technically, they should be checking. Uh, they probably should be checking the box that is not a contingency. Because it, effectively, zero means they have no time frame for this contingency. That's what we would believe. Because when you look at that time frame, so they've got to give written notice within this number of days. They're saying the now, thing is this contract is not subject to. Correct, that's what they're saying. Now, here's what you want to be careful of, because I've seen this. Don't let it stay blank. Blank doesn't mean zero. This, they don't check the other box. That's right. They don't check the other box. And in, a, and in A, they just leave it blank. Buyer says, this is a limiting number of days. I've got all the way to close it. Buyer says, if I don't have anything in that, I'm not limited to how much time I have to be able to terminate the contract, how much time I have for buyer approval. I got all the way to close it. So we don't, if you've got the listing, don't ever let it stay blank. As a minimum, you have a dispute. Oh, I can't even like anything. Yeah, we don't like blank blanks. <laughs> blankety blank blank blanks. Don't like blankety blank blanks. And you contract your even blanks in that page one four. The blanks. Where? One four. I mean, that four on page one of the, you don't check anything if it doesn't apply. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's a good point, but we don't have blanks, but we have our boxes. boxes. Okay. Yeah. Now, you do have one blank under natural resources, but if you didn't check any of the boxes, then. That blank doesn't, doesn't work. Does that help with the third party financing addendum and how that works with the appraisal addendum? And then you see your five page explanation of the appraisal addendum uh, plus the two pages. Uh, and, and hopefully, because we have this and all our good folks on the Zoom thing uh, have it also, that'll help. But we also have this five pages on our intranet. So everybody can have access to be able to do that. Now, the next document we have is the, or should have, uh, pass this. I can get this to work over here. All of these pages with like information is all helpful information for you. For yes, you. from me. Thank you. Exactly. Um, because you know, I'm a helpful guy. You are a very helpful, helpful guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have to agree. At least that's my intent. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it works, huh? Funnier than Dick Dillingham. And funnier than Dick Dillingham. I mean, you know, I, I'm on a roll. Now, I, I would encourage you. Because Dick is very sensitive about that. Try not to say anything to him about it. He knows my attitude about that and he accepts it. But, you know, I think if he had from the agents who he... Well, Dick saved a lot of bacon over the years. <laughs> Sometimes what I have works. And, I, and it's just like I, we talk about the fact that sometimes when you're in a little bit of a discussion about a transaction, um, sometimes bringing my name up makes a difference. Yeah. Sometimes it's it doesn't. Difference, sometimes it creates challenge. So. I don't know this one, but one time I was buying land and it was, I mean, a couple of years ago, and you actually helped me do another acre of what I actually marketed for. Really? Because of certain verbiage that you, you in a roundabout way connect me with uh, Charles Kramer and Charles Kramer certain verbiage in there, the contract, right? So. What that means Bob? is that, Yes. Yes. Yeah. Bob, this is Marjorie. Hello, Marjorie. How the heck are you? Hello. So I'm good. Thank you. And yourself? Good. Thank you. Many years ago, when I was at the Park City's office, I had a multiple offer situation in Frisco. And one of the fine agents in our office here um, wasn't happy with um, her uh, client not being considered first. And she brought up your name and she said, well, Bob Baker says da 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 da. And all I could think of was, Bob Baker, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> and why are it they doesn't always work. <laughs> I think this is yeah, so did you ever get it resolved? 
Oh, yeah. And and actually, the winner of the contest was from the office, just another client, client of another agent. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get this where it'll move down to the. I'm always happy to have help. <laughs> I'm watching. I just can't get the, uh, yeah. the thing to scroll down. Yeah, I think if we do, I can't even find it. Oh, there it is. Where you want it to go? All the way I want to go down to the temporary residential lease. Okay. Uh, How far down? A little bit further. There it is. Whoops. Yeah, it went back up. Like there here? Go. Good. Special yeah, provisions? that's great. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. You have got the touch. Good job. I'm surprised you didn't ask me to help. You know what? I could have because she was right there. <laughs> I give her a chance. I offered. <laughs> she did offer. You That's did okay. So, a couple of things on the temporary residential lease. Uh, and thank you, Cindy, for helping out here. So, our folks on the Zoom can have it. Uh, first thing under term. If you have the seller, put in a number of days, not a date, because closings get moved around and your seller is expecting three days after closing. And then closing got moved two days. And if you've got a date in there, there's a problem. So for a seller, if you've got the seller, put a number of days in there. Uh, the, the other thing is that we need to remember, because I've, I've just had this question from one of our Newer agents, uh, if the seller terminates early, if the seller surrenders property early, no refund. He doesn't get any money back. And it says so right there in paragraph four. So if the seller asks for a two week lease back, and then after a week, he's ready to move on. Because uh, remember, the seller pays the rent at closing. So the buyer receives not held by the title company, paid to the, to the seller, pays it to the buyer at closing. So the buyer has the money and he doesn't have to refund any to the seller. Now, hopefully there's a deposit. If you've got the buyer, hopefully you're able to negotiate a deposit. Sometimes in this very strong multiple offer, you can't. I understand it because the seller says, I want temporary residence lease for 10 days and I want it for free. And you know what? If you're not willing to do that, next, go to the next buyer. And I understand that's a challenge. Uh, so that gets down to the negotiation of it. But you just need to be understand as you explain to your client, okay, here are the provisions, here are the risk, here's what we prefer, and let's see if we can negotiate that. If we can't, here's what it does to you. Because if, if you don't have a deposit, then the buyer's totally at risk that the seller leaves it the way he's supposed to and the time frame he's supposed to. And so that's just totally a little bit of a challenge to work through it. Bob, uh, do you think yes. it's a good idea? I generally do this. And you tell me not to, I won't. But to put three days after closing and funding at 11.59 p.m. So there's no misunderstanding. So you, you do that in special provisions. I'm sorry? You can do that in special provisions of the lease. Of the lease, see? Oh, really? Of the lease. I've always, okay. I always put it up there too. Well, time. You, can, you can do that. You can put it up there. It, it's okay. Uh, our challenge is, uh, and, and by the way, we should also address this when we're doing closing and funding as opposed to a temporary residential lease. We ought to, in paragraph 11, special reasons of the contract, indicate when the buyer's going to get possession. The, 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 the time of day, 8 p.m., 10, whatever. Same thing here. If you put it up there in the term, 11 p.m., 9 p.m., like that, then you're probably okay. Uh, it, it's implied that it's a full day, and that's when it is. What you really want to do is, if you want it in an earlier time frame, you want the seller out by 5 p.m. or 8 p.m. or something like that, that last day, so the buyer can start moving in. Uh, you know, that may be a time frame you don't have. But having a time frame in there is a good idea, however you do it. I think that is a good idea. And is it okay also in special provisions that if your seller asked for a two-week lease, lease back and then was out in a week and one of the, but the lease back fee would be prorated? Well, you'd have to do that. I mean, that's a business deal because if you don't do that, seller does, it does not prorate it. Right. Seller doesn't get any back. So if the seller is able to negotiate, and you do this when you've got a longer lease back, maybe you're 30 days or three weeks, something like that, you wouldn't do it over three, four, or five days. 
uh, sales says, you know what? There is a possibility that I'll get out here. And the buyer says, that's great. As soon as you can get out, I'm good with that. In fact, yeah, I'll prorate. We'll prorate it and give you back. I, if I'm going to prorate it, I'd put a dollar amount in there. I wouldn't presume that anybody is going to be able to calculate how much it's going to be. Uh, so I'd, I'd actually put a dollar amount in there. Say, so, okay, here's, here's how much per day we're going to prorate it. Um, but yeah, you could do that. They're right. Oh my gosh. Right. Anyway. Okay. Now, um, here's one of the other risks. This is especially a challenge if there's any animosity at all between the buyer and the seller. Seller's going to stay in for 10 days past temporary residential lease or past closing. At closing, look at paragraph 12. Landlord may enter at reasonable times to inspect the property. Tenant shall provide the landlord door keys and access codes to allow access to the property during the terms of the lease. So it says, there's no way I'm giving that SOB buyer my stuff until I move out. You're not getting nothing. And that's a challenge, but that's not what they've agreed to in the contract. So if the seller says no, and, and in some cases it creates real challenges. So the seller is gone, they're out of town, they're on vacation, there's nobody there effectively, and something happens to the property. I mean, imagine when we had that bad winter storm, people were out and things broke and froze and there was nobody there to go in and turn the water off or deal with anything, all kinds of challenges, mm -hmm. which kind of gets us to paragraph 14. In a case where the title to the property and the possession of the property are done at different times, the seller needs to understand until they deliver possession, even though they no longer own the property, they are responsible for the property. And you've got two controlling provisions. One in paragraph 10, possession, where the seller is agreeing to deliver possession in its present condition, which is the condition at the time of the contract, to the buyer. And so the seller hasn't yet delivered possession and anything that goes wrong, anything that breaks, water heater breaks, seller's responsible. Seller has to take care of it. Now, because of what just happened a few weeks ago, we got many insurance issues. It's why in paragraph 10 of the contract and in paragraph 16 of the lease, on so the second page of the lease, we address insurance. There can never, ever be an exception where there's a temporary residential lease and you have not given written notice, such as an email, to your client, whichever side, you have to talk to your insurance agent because you are going to own a property with a tenant in it or you're going to be a tenant in a property you no longer own. And yesterday, you had a homeowner's policy. You sold the property now, but you're still there. So when the storm comes through and blows the roof off, whose insurance are you going to take care of? We don't know. I mean, we, have, we clearly don't know. And we will never give our opinion. I don't care if you're an insurance agent. I don't care if you had this just happen to you with the same insurance company. You will never give your opinion. You'll say, you know what? That's a question for your insurance agent. Call them. Talk to them. Or talk to that company. We have got, we, we have, we have all, since the, the storm, and even before then we had this, but since the storm, we've had this issue and we've had clients who call their insurance, okay, who's insurance? Well, that's not a question for the agent. That was something that should have already been resolved. But if you're going to do a temporary residential lease, you have to deal with that insurance issue. We have to give them that notice. Otherwise, we got big trouble coming. Because we don't know whose insurance companies are going to take care of. And by the way, different insurance companies have different opinions about how they're going to do that. So it gets to be a real, real challenge. Uh, so we, we see that. Now, one of the challenges with the temporary residential lease, with the seller's temporary residential lease, we've had a closing. I was transferred. Contract, the contract no longer exists. 
you're done. You're out of here. You're gone. And it's a 30-day temporary residence lease. Two weeks into it, there's a problem. Or when they get ready for the seller to move out and the buyer to move in, say, wait, 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 wait. Seller didn't do these repairs or seller, you know, didn't leave it clean or whatever. So do I give them the deposit back or not? That's between the two of them. Now, the tenant and landlord, buyer and seller, can amend the lease, <clears throat> not the contract. Because the contract's gone. Contract closed, no longer exists. The lease still does. It creates a tricky situation. Now, depending on your relationship with your client, you're going to want to support them and work through it, but you need for them to understand, here are my limitations here. Here, here are things I can and cannot do. Uh, this contract is closed, and I have not just almost no authority. I have no authority. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> you know, I'm just a useless whatever. So but I'll be supporting you. I'll be glad helping you understand here things, but here's, Here's who you need to talk to. It's not me. I can help because you've got a lease, you've closed. Uh, now you've got to deal with the terms of the lease. And, and, and one of our challenges as agents is while we're establishing rapport and helping our clients out and work through the process, uh, we want them to love us and feel good about us. So when we tell them no, we want to do it nicely. We don't want to say, hey, it's closed. I'm out of here. Well, if, if you want to have lunch someday, give me a call. But that's it. No more. You, you don't want to go down that road. We good? Questions on that? Zoom folks, you got any good things there that you want to jump on? We talked about the temporary residence, because we're having a lot of temporary residence release, a lot of seller's lease backs. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's tough to negotiate some of these things, but we just need to know as we try to negotiate, here's the goal of what a buyer would like to do. Here's the goal of what a seller would like to do. And hear the risk if we're not able to do that. Hey, Bob, it's Nick Biggs. I got a question. Hello, Nick. How are you doing? Good, man. Um, so in paragraph 14, I guess I'm just a little bit confused on the repair and maintaining the property, how that relates. You said if a water heater busts, then it's the seller's or the tenant's responsibility. But then it later it says, tenant shall promptly repair at tenant's expense any damage to the property caused directly or indirectly by act or admission of the tenant, blah, blah, blah. So I wouldn't think that a, a water heater that just ends its you know, useful life would be directly or indirectly by an act of omission. Yeah, it would be. But here's the question that has to be asked. At the time the buyer and seller entered into the contract, was the water heater working? Yes. The answer would be yes. When the seller delivers possession to the buyer, the water heater still needs to be working. So if before closing, a week before closing, the water heater went out, guess what? Seller's gonna have to repair it. Seller's gonna have to replace it because the seller has to deliver possession of the property with everything working, everything that's there on the day they enter the contract unless it was excluded or accepted in some manner. So the reality is this water heater uh, and said, well, it's not the tenant's fault. It just is an old water heater. Doesn't matter. And that's part of what it indirectly means. The reality is we've got to look back to what was going on at the time of the contract. If it was there, if it was working, and the seller delivers possession, it still needs to be working. Does that, does that answer that question, kind of? Yeah, it does. Okay. I think, I think it's a, a, an interesting situation where I would imagine – that that would end up like, especially if it's a big ticket item, right? Like, let's say, hey, well, AC, air conditioning. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that I can see that that's that would end up in an interpretation in a court is because I doubt well, many sellers. Yeah, and and we don't. You're exactly right, Nick, but and we don't ever want to be in court. We don't ever want to rely on a judge interpreting our contracts. What we do from our position. When our client says, well, I, I don't really think that's what that means. I don't think I'm responsible to put in a new AC or to fix the AC. I mean, it's going to be $3,000. I don't think I'm required to do that because, you know, the, the buyer knew the seller, that, that the AC was kind of on its last legs and they accepted this as is and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't think I'm responsible. You're, you smile and you say to yourself, you know what? Uh, buyers and sellers get to interpret this. We don't we're gonna give you written notice to seek advice from a legal 
counsel from an attorney and see what they want to do. What everybody wants to do is avoid court. It's always cheaper to buy even an expensive AC than to go to court because your legal costs are going to be way in excess of that. But it's a, it's a decision they've got to make. What we've got to do is help them say, you know what? This is what it says. We're not going to give you legal advice on what we think it means. And if the two sides are in dispute, and, it, and the more expensive the item, the more the two sides get in dispute. The more the seller says, well, I don't think I'm really responsible for a whole new AC system. I don't think that's what that means. And then the buyer says, well, that's exactly what that means. Now we've got a buyer and seller who need to both talk to their attorneys and make a decision on what they're going to do. Does that make sense, Nick? Our job is to provide them information. It's not to interpret the contract. Not say, well, here's what it means. I can't believe you're not smart enough to know that's what it means. <laughs> I can see it. That's what it means. Where, you know, do I need to send you back to school? Jeez. You see, we, we don't go down that road. We go down the road and say, okay, I understand you and the buyer have a dispute about what this means. That's attorney time. And that's where we send them. And we let him deal with that. Are we good with that? Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Okay. I see Cindy has raised hey, her Bob. Yes, question. This, this is Charles Brazil. Can I ask a follow-up question to Nick Biggs? Yes. So if we go up, if we go up to paragraph nine, condition of property, mm -hmm. where tenant tenant accepts property in its present condition and state of repair at the at the commencement of the lease. Now here's the question that I that I have here. Upon termination, tenant shall surrender the property to the landlord in the condition required under the contract, except normal wear and tear and any casualty loss. So in a follow-up kind of to Nick's question, except normal wear and tear and casualty loss. So how would that play into kind of the question that Nick asked about well, the AC or hot water heat? It's water a great industry? question. And if we had the buyer we would use that and we would say, you know what? We think the water here just wear and tear was old and it just broke and I think AC was old and it just broke. We think that's normal wear and tear. Um, so you know, the buyer, you know, I mean, the seller would say, we don't think we have to replace it. We think that's just normal wear and tear. Uh, we agree, present condition, time of the contract. We also agree here, present condition dealing with the term of the lease. Uh, this is what each side is going to take their position. So they're going to say, I think it's just a normal wear and tear thing. Our says, no, it's not. I think paragraph 14 applies. I think you've got to maintain and repair anything that goes wrong. And now we've got a dispute between the buyer and the seller. And that's why we have attorneys out there. And you're going to have attorneys, Charles, who will make a good living off of both sides of the dispute on <laughs> 9 and 14. Because, you know, and, and I'll promise you, and we don't, we've not been in a court case on this and hopefully we'll never be because it, it really is no, no kidding aside. The expense of being in court, I mean, day one, you get ready to write out a $10,000 check because it's going to cost you that and more as you go through the process. It, it's cheaper to solve whatever the problem is. Um, but the reality is uh, if you end up in court, you not only have two attorneys that are on each side of this, you're now relying on a judge mm -hmm. and the judge is going to, uh, based on his set of experience or her set of experiences, make a decision about what they, what the judge thinks this really means and heaven help us. If we have any idea what that's going to happen. I mean, it's a flip of the coin. is what will happen there. Uh, but it's a very important thing to be familiar with nine and 14, you know, the whole concept, because you also have the wear and tear, uh, provision in the contract itself. So it's important to understand the normal wear and tear, uh, we have that in, in the property code, we have that in the leases itself. Um, we even define normal wear and tear in, in the property code, section 92, and deal with that. Uh, but, now, but this creates a basis for each side to make a dispute. Remember, what I would encourage you to stay safe with, don't be the interpreter of this. Don't say to your seller, you know what? You're exactly right, man. That's just normal wear and tear. There's no way you're responsible for that. Uh, dig in your heels, fight it. You know, I'm, I'm behind you. This whole, don't have that. Don't have that conversation. You don't get to interpret this. You don't get to say, here's clearly what that means. What you need to say, if, and the only time you need to have this conversation is when there's a dispute. And the buyer says, no, 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 no. That's not what that means. Here's what 14 is. That prevails. 
That's attorney time. That's not real estate agent time. That's attorney time. Uh, and you need to do it while you're supporting your client without them feeling like you're abandoning it. you be able to work through that. Charles, does that make semi sense? And give your sense. It does, but I was wanting to focus on the casualty loss, but that's fine. Hopefully we'll just never have it and we'll call Charles Kramer. Oh, well, and, and it does happen. And it happens on a regular basis. Here's the challenge with casualty loss. Because then you get into an insurance issue. And hopefully we've given that good advice to our client. And now they're going to say, you know, what we're going to deal with now is what our insurance company says. And so now they're dealing with buyer and seller and their insurance agents and what they're going to do there. Uh, and that's what we work through. Now, casualty loss in and of itself doesn't automatically have to deal with insurance. You can have a casualty loss and there's no insurance involved at all. Uh, but paragraph 14 is what covers casualty loss in the contract itself as you deal with that. But when you look at this, uh, you, you, you know, the seller can make a really good case for, wait a minute, you know, buyer, here's what you accepted, number nine. Here's what the deal is. Seller and the buyer said, no, no, seller, here's what you accepted in the 14. And that's going to prevail. Well, now you've got a dispute. And you got to say, you know, guys, let, let's hug and get along well. Let's say all be nice to each other. Thank you, sir. Yep, yes, sir. Thank you. Now, it's interesting. The uh, next form that I have in here deals with an interesting situation that kind of relates to a lot of the issues that we've talked about. And it's if we're in an intermediary situation. And if you're intermediary, uh, and I got an interesting call recently uh, from an agent who is in our Rockwall office and said, well, Bob, I'm making an offer on one of your agent's listings in Plano, and I see you're the broker in both of those, so doesn't that make this intermediary? No, it doesn't, because every brokerage operates under a brokerage license. Our broker's license here, which all of the salespersons, their license is under our brokerage license, is a different brokerage license than in Rockwall. And, and, and even though I'm the designated broker in Rockwall, Mike is the designated broker here. I'm the designated realtor. You know, it's not intermediary. Intermediary only exists with two agents in this office, two agents in any office, because it's the broker who's always the intermediary. And so and we clarified that. Now, here's our challenge with the intermediary relationship as we work through this. There's a normal tendency when there's anything going wrong, there's any challenge in a transaction where we have both sides. The buyer and the seller look at each other and look at us and say, you know what, this is all Keller Williams. You guys had the whole thing. You guys handled everything. You guys were in control of and responsible for everything that happened. So you don't get to slough this off on Remax or somebody else. This is all you. So we're looking to you to fix the problem. That's a risk in every intermediate relationship, even when it's done exactly correctly. We have two separate different agents uh, in this office, one seller or the other buyer. Uh, the reality is if anything goes wrong, they immediately begin to look at the brokerage. In fact, we, we, we just had a situation where we have both sides and there was a problem. And the buyer effectively threatened to sell the, sue the seller and send a demand notice. And the seller's immediate response to our agent, what's your office going to do about this? What's your office going to do about taking care of this? For some reason, she felt like we were responsible. Well, we didn't complete the seller's disclosure notice. We didn't represent anything about the property. There's not anything about the situation where we're responsible. But that was the seller's immediate reaction. That tends to be a human reaction. And when you stick in the intermediary factor, it's a problem. Now, we look at paragraph D of this intermediary relationship because what you've got is the listing agreement by a rep agreement, authorization for intermediary in the transaction. You've got an intermediary. Charlie's got the seller. Cindy's got the buyer. We've got an intermediary. And when, when Cindy's buyer makes the offer, they're going to include this intermediary relationship notice with the offer. Buyer's going to sign off on it. Paragraph D, we're going to check the first box, broker will appoint, and you're going to put Charlie's name representing the owner, Cindy's name representing the prospect. 
And now we've got a human relationship. We've given that further notice because when you sign the listen agreement by a rep agreement, they authorize the intermediary, but that was a concept. It was theoretical. Well, now we actually have it. And so what we have here in paragraph E of this notice is we have this second affirmation that now that we have it, they're consenting for the broker to move far as intermediary. You know, we, we kind of agreed to it and listening him by a rep, but now here it is. Because maybe they say, you know, now that I see it and understand what the limitations are, I'm not sure I really want to do this now. So this is, a, this is an important reaffirmation here. So that goes up with the offer over to the listing agent over Charlie. Charlie presents us along with the offer to the seller. So the seller signs off on doing it. Now, I, uh, I have been accused of bad behavior. I have been accused by many of our other fellow brokers and other KDW offices and even their offices. Well, Bob, we know your rule. Everybody tells us you prohibit, absolutely will not allow one agent in your office to represent both sides. We know it's an absolute no-no, won't happen, period, under any circumstances. Well, if, if brokers and other offices think that, well, so do our agents. Our agent says, we don't even try. Don't even talk about it. In fact, let's don't go down the permission road. Let's go down the forgiveness road. I, I, I'm not a naive person. I know we have transactions and end up closing with one agent in the middle. I know that happens. Now, it gives me great grief that somehow I didn't get to the road across because it's not a prohibition. It's a process. My position is if you have this where you want to represent both sides, there's a procedure. And the first step in the procedure is to talk to me. Management has to approve it. Now, there are circumstances in which it's been approved. They're pretty rare, and, and it's unusual, uh, but for the most part, it won't be. But there is a process. There's not an absolute no. So don't come and say, Bob, I know it's no. I, Brian, I heard that's how you are. It's not how it is. Said, well, let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. Uh, the most common time it happens is you've got an open house where you already represent the seller, and unrepresented buyer pops in. Say, wow, I love this. I'd like to buy this. Can you represent me? Because the buyer says, you know, if I'm working directly with the listing agent, I'm going to get a much better deal on this. And we'll really work something great out because the listing agent knows all, you know, everything about this. So the good thing has happened. You held an open house to sell your seller's house, and here's a buyer shows up and wants to buy it. What you've got to determine this buyer who wants to buy your listing are they capable of representing themselves or not? In other words, do they need advice and opinion to move forward? Do they need advocacy? Do they need someone on their side fulfilling the fiduciary duties? If they do, it can't be you. You already owe those fiduciary duties to the seller. And, and for example, confidentiality, full disclosure, royalty, all those you already owe those to the seller, you can't kind of split them up and say, well, I'll kind of, if you take on the seller, if you've already got the seller, you take on the buyer, you just went from advice and opinion to your seller to totally neutral for both sides. No longer any more advice to your seller. Your seller said, well, what do you think? Should I take that offer? Is that a good offer? I'm sorry. I'm representing both sides. You guys agree to that. No advice or opinion. You guys are on your own. No advice or opinion to the buyer, no advice or opinion to the seller from that point forward. So if you can't give advice or opinion to the buyer and they need it, you wouldn't take them on as a client, would you? Would you? No. Because you can't provide what they need. If you determine the buyer says, yeah, I kind of need some help. First time home buyer, new in the area, really need some help. Can't be you. You can't be the one who gives them advice and opinion. Now, you can get another agent in our office who can take him on as a client, give him advice and opinion under an enemy relationship, negotiate something with that agent in the office, work through that process. And, and we've got a whole procedure for doing that in our intranet where we've got our, our intermediate relationships and how that works. But if a buyer does not need help, 
I said, oh man, we bought so lots of houses. We know how this works. Uh, we're fully capable of representing ourselves. Thank you for the offer. We'll take care of that. Move forward with them as a customer. You represent the seller fully as a client. The buyer is going to represent themselves. You'll treat them fairly and honestly as a customer. You can facilitate the transaction, go through the process and, and work through it because the buyer said, I don't need your advice and opinion. I can handle it on my own. That's perfect. You fully represent your seller, let him take care of it, move forward in the situation. Now, if you have a buyer says, yeah, I, we think we can, we think we pretty well know what we want to do. Uh, we, we have, actually, I already have a lender. We're feeling pretty good. Um, we're not entirely sure how to fill out the contract form. Um, say, not a problem. I'll tell you what I'll do. Just because I like you, you seem like really nice people. I ordinarily wouldn't do this, but you had a hard life. You spent time in Oklahoma. So I, need, I know you need help. I'm going to write up an offer. And what you need to know, we call this a reverse offer. It's going to be written entirely from the seller's perspective. It's what the seller wants. It'll be the seller's price, seller's terms, seller addendum. I'll write that up. I'll present it to you, and then you decide if you like it or not. If you like it, accept it. If you don't, make changes and make a counter offer, and I'll present it back to the seller. But I, that'll get us started. And that way, when they don't know what to do to even get it started, that reverse offer lets you move through that process and lets you do that. But that way, seller gets full representation, buyer doesn't. One of the interesting things that one of our uh, team leaders and one of our sister offices, when we were talking about this provision, because uh, because he uh, he says I I've never had one of my agents that I've allowed them to represent both sides. He says, "Here's my problem: the listing agent has sold the seller on this full representation, and you're going to pay me six percent, and I'm going to fully represent you and advise you. I'm your advocate, and then all of a sudden you take on a buyer client, and that advocacy and all that representation drops." And this team leader in the seller office said, so how does the listing agent continue to justify their commission? I don't think you can do it. I think the seller just said, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I don't think you should get the same money you got yesterday when you fully represented me because I think things have changed. I don't think you should get as much. And it's hard to argue with that. Um, and that's why in their offices, you know, I've, I've never had it. I've never done it. Um, and that's okay. I, I mean, uh, he's, he's got a stronger prohibition, at least in my case, even though I have the reputation of saying no, I actually say, well, let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. Let's work through the process uh, as we, we do it. Because here, here's what you really do need to know about intermediary. Trek does not like in relationships, even though it's legal. Even though it's in the License Act and in the rules of track, track says it's very difficult for agents to go through an enemy relationship without making mistakes, without being negligent. Things will happen. And if you've got a track complaint and, and they find out it's intermediary, uh, you're automatically behind the eight ball. I mean, you're, it's, it's an uphill climb. Let me tell you who loves enemy relationships. Attorneys. Yes. Plaintiff attorneys love it. Because they know the chances are that we didn't do it right and things will happen. And so we want to avoid that if at all possible. Any questions from our Zoom folks on the intermediary and kind of what our procedure is and how we work through this? Everybody semi good? Now. Got one, got one yeah. clarification, Bob. This is yeah. Christina. On the intermediary, if, if you do the reverse offer with your blessing, then, well, that doesn't even apply to the intermediary, does Because it? it's not intermediary. Okay. But if you're doing that reverse offer, my assumption would be that you need to absolutely be sure and get the IABS form signed. Yeah, initial. So, good point. Initial. Anytime you're working with an unrepresented buyer, um, and if you're going to do this situation, it's not intermediary, you've got a seller, client, buyer, customer. One, anytime you've got an unrepresented buyer that shows up, has an issue to your property, you make sure they get the IBS form. The other thing that I would use the Texas Realtors 
representation disclosure form. Uh, we used to just put it in paragraph 11, you know, I represent seller, but I'd use that form because that shows you give that to the buyer and they sign off on that and that shows who you represent. Um, so you need to make sure that you've done both of those uh, as you as you work through it um, and, and deal with that. Uh, so yeah, you'd want to make sure because you don't have any media seller client buyer customer as you're dealing with that. Uh, so yeah, make sure you, you, of course, you've already done the IABS form with your seller. You did that when you got the listing and worked through that process. So yeah, I'll we'll make sure Thank you do you. that. Uh -huh. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, the last little thing I want to touch on is, is the last form. Um, well, Cindy's magic touch has disappeared. <laughs> why, why is it? Why is it? And it just keeps moving, I think. Because you're so busy with all your forms. Okay, How far okay you that's, go? so go a little bit further. Okay. I oh, see that's why it's not working. It's not the arrow's not working. Uh, okay, okay, good. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. Okay. So the last little thing that uh, I want us to touch on is the notice of buyer's termination contract. This was one of the two forms that was not originally changed when Trek approved the new contract forms in their November meeting, which is why in their February meeting they had to prove it because in the first item on this form, it used to say paragraph 23, which is no longer correct. So they had to correct this form. Same thing on the short sale addendum, it references a paragraph 23, so they had to change that to paragraph five. So we now have that new language. What I want you to notice on this form are all the rights of termination so that when you've got a situation where you need to say, gee, can we terminate? What can we terminate under? This is kind of your little cheat sheet. This is kind of little thing that says, yeah, here are the different rights of termination. Uh, here's the things you get to do. Uh, what, what's, what the other will apply to, there are certain circumstances in both of the leases, the, the addendums for residential lease, addendum for fixture leases, where they're responsible to the sellers and rights of termination for a buyer that would be clicked under eight because you don't actually have uh, the two new addendums addressed in these seven items. So you do that under other. Uh, but it's important for you to recognize, hear those rights of termination and make sure you check off the right box. For example, if your buyer on, on the very first day after they've got a contract, decides they're gonna terminate under the Mantra or HOA, that's box number four. So don't accidentally check off box number one, unless your buyer intends to pay an option fee. Now the buyer, may decide to go ahead and pay an option fee and do number one, just to keep anybody from fussing at it. Because sellers and listing agents will fuss at the buyer when they check off number four. So, well, okay, okay, I understand you kind of get it right, but where's the option fee? We want the option fee. You got to pay an option fee to terminate. Well, we're not terminating under that. Well, well, then we're going to sue you. We want the option fee. No, um, you know. And by the way, you need to make sure you get to earn some money into the title company. No, we don't. Not if we're terminating before that time frame. So make sure you're checking off the right box as you work through this because it could cause you to have a faulty termination notice. And make sure it goes to the proper people in paragraph 21 or notices paragraph of the contract. You kind of work through that. That makes semi good sense as you work through it. So if you terminate, okay, now I'm going to sound like it's my first day to be an agent. But if you terminate what, for whatever reason on this sheet and in the notices on whatever paragraph that is on the paragraph 21, um, it doesn't even have the agent's blank. email address or and all it has is the buyer's email address. Yep. Okay, so, the, so you, the question Cindy has here, uh, and it depends on which side we're talking about, if paragraph 21 is not correctly completed, sometimes it's blank. Sometimes it just has names and doesn't have email addresses, which we prefer. If you're the buyer and say the buyer is going to terminate on some provision here and send it over, if the listing side is blank, then the imputed notice applies. You can send it to the listing agent. Good to see you, Clint. Take care, sir. Bye, Bye. So Bye. you'll have the listing agent's email information in the listing in the MLS. 
So by sending it to the listing agent, that's sufficient notice. Your problem is if you've got to send notice to the buyer, let's say the buyer didn't pay the earnest money in time, seller can send notice, uh, and we don't have any information on the buyer side, we may not even have an email address, whatever, uh, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. So the listing agent needs to talk to the buyer's agent and says, okay, here's what the seller's going to do. We need an effective email address so we can send notice. I see. I've always just sent it to, if I terminate, I send it to the listing agent and then the title company too. Sure, both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you're, if the buyer's going to terminate, you send it both to the listing agent and the title company. If the buyer, or, I mean, if the seller's um, email address is on there, do you need to contact them too as part of compliance? Or? No. Okay. If you've got their email address, you wouldn't use it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, that was it. Now, there's, an, there's a, one more important statement here. Note, under eight, Notes. this notice is not an election of remedies. Release of the earnest money is governed by the contract. This is simply a termination of the contract, not a release of earnest money. That's a separate issue. Yes, and some title companies require you to do that release of earnest money. Some of them don't, even if it's just an option for you. Well, I've not run across a title company recently who requires both sides to sign off on an option period. If if there are some out there, they shouldn't be doing it because it's an unrestricted yeah, right term. My, my buyer was really pissed. Oh, it should be. Yeah, they. <laughs> you shouldn't. Man, it took like ten days. He was so angry. Yeah, yeah. So it shouldn't shouldn't be the case. Now, what the title company will do is say, "We want the buyer's earnest money check to clear the bank." Yes. We're not going to refund your earnest money until we know we have good funds. Oh no, the seller would sign it. Yeah. See, buyer, the title company shouldn't be requiring that. Now, this brings me to the last point. We've covered all the material and this last point about release of earnest money. Uh, I'm on a, uh, I've got a cause. A mission. And, I've, and it's an incredible uphill climb. And I've got to deal with Trek. I've got to deal with the title company. I'll need support from Texas Realtors. I will, you know, we've only got 23 paragraphs now. And I think this can be done in a new paragraph 24. I want language in the contract where the parties agree that if the buyer terminates, the parties terminate under some provision in the contract or an addendum, the title company will release the earnest money without requiring all signatures. And somewhere in that language, it will release the title company from liability. Amen. I'm tired of having this situation where we're battling over the earnest money when the parties have clearly in the contract agreed. If this happens, buyer gets the earnest money back. Okay, well, where's yours? Well, we got to talk to sell for it. No, that's not what the contract says. So that's my mission. We'll see how that happens. So we'll work through that. Um, you know, yes, ma'am. Ask me a question, Charlie. Quick comment. Yes, ma'am. Where I got a um, number of years ago, ended up giving up my commission voluntarily to keep a seller happy. But on the um, HOA, delivery of the HOA docs in a certain number of days, um, I looked at the offer and when it became a contract, I understood that other cultures make their ones look like a two. So when my assistant got all the things lined up to order the HOA doc. She thought it said 20 because it looked like a two to her. It was a 10 to me, not a 10. So anyway, the buyer, the buyers ended up uh, trying to get out of the office, the contract. I mean, he was getting a divorce. Well, he, he thought he was going okay, to so, get Okay, so this was a delivery of HOA docs. This is a delivery of HOA docs issue? The HOA docs did not get, we had, we have enough grounds to get the earnest money for the seller. How? The HOA docs were not delivered in time for that. They were supposed to be delivered in 10. My assistant thought it was 20. Well, but delivered. that doesn't give sellers, I'm sorry? that does not give sellers rights of the earnest money. The, the earnest money. Seller doesn't get the earnest money. Because, uh, well, the seller, the people were defaulting. The buyers were defaulting. They kept trying. Had they to get received out. the HOA docs? Had the buyer received the HOA docs? No. Then they can terminate. Yeah. Doesn't um, matter the number of days in the addition. We did not deliver the documents in the required time. I understand that, but that gave buyers rights termination. Talk about trouble. 
I'm Megan. Okay. So, so the buyer had a right to terminate. We'll talk about this separately because we need, we can go over okay. there. Okay. So uh, now that Megan's here, any questions? <laughs> so, so, uh, so, huh? Appraisal waiver, right? That's what you're doing. Yeah, we, well, we've already done that, and 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 we've had lots of great questions. I figured you had coached people <laughs> dealing with the old okay, appraisal so, issue. So, Bob, I just heard from a, a listening agent who got forty. One of my my one of my clients had offered about forty offers. They took the one that was not the highest, the one that removed all contingencies. Yeah. Financing. Yeah. What is your feedback? Well. And that's, that's a good thing for the seller. So as you remove contingencies, everybody needs to understand, are there still some contingencies inferred by the title company and the lender? You know, because you can take all the financial contingencies out on a conventional loan, but the lender may say, you know, that's fine, but here's what we still need. And so you may still have some requirements there. Um, but, but I understand removing contingency increases the certainty of close. You need to look very carefully on what's being removed for example, the HOA docs, right. title company is going to require resales to. Right. And so somewhere in there, you're going to, somebody's going to have to agree to pay. If we don't use the addendum, then the seller is going to automatically incur that cost. Right, right. So you want to check the box to buy it. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, if you use that addendum, and we did, one of the things we talked about was the HOA addendum, and it may well be that to use choice two, three, or four, as opposed to one, to get rid of that contingency as you work through it. Now, there's another thing in a multiple offer situation, and we just, we just had this happen. Uh, buyer was in a multiple offer situation. Buyer offered almost, nine, well, it was 90000 above list price. And this was not a million-dollar-plus property. This was about a $600,000 office property. Where the listing was like $600,000. Uh, they offered like six ninety. dollars and so in, in that situation, um, we, you know, we, we, and they waived the appraisal addendum and all that stuff, but, and, and they actually ended up in the contract working through it. But another thought, here's the buyer and they're going to pay all this additional money. And we may end up with an appraisal and with a value issue and things like that. Why shouldn't the buyer, like us say 600,000 each property, one of the things built into that sales price is in most cases a 6% commission, $36,000. Why does the buyer, rather than increasing the value, say, I'll pay everybody's commission. I'll pay the listing commission. I'll pay the buyer's commission. This nets the seller $36,000 more and doesn't create a problem on value. So we're seeing buyers cover all costs, but we're not yet seeing buyers say, what about commissions? If a, and if a buyer, particularly in this situation, you know, it, particularly if you've got a cash buyer, and the buyer says, hey, I'll cover that. We just want to increase the net for the seller. But even with financing, presuming they've got good money and good reserve, large down payment, so forth, that's anything you can do to increase the seller's net without increasing the sales price. It, and sometimes you have to explain that to the listing agent, but that creates a really attractive offer if the listing agent understands it. This totally going to work for this one. I asked the agent and said, I'm got, I'm just got the I said, if you get a, she has 15 in the class, I said, if you get a ludicrous offer, you know, I'm talking about just ludicrous, you just text me ludicrous. <laughs> she was still going through the path. She texted, I have two ludicrous. And I said, okay, is ludicrous 10% over? Or are we talking like 30? Are we talking some stupid ludicrous? You got to work in the market. <laughs> and she goes, it's over 10%. And I was like, okay, so this could work because here's the thing. Any, they're already 15,000 over the highest comp. So they're already over comp. So it's already- What's the general over. price range? 315. Okay. The highest is 300 in the neighborhood. So we're talking a commission of about 18,000 or so, 18, 20,000. And by taking on that cost, improves that seller's net. And then my client doesn't have to go to the 850 that some other- Yep, offers. yep. That could be a really good thing to do. Thank you. Improve that net. You absolutely. Okay, Zoom folks. If I have some Zoom folks that are still there, thank you. I see you are. Uh, uh, any last minute questions or simply? Yes, yes. Uh, this yes. is Christine again, and I promise uh -huh. this is my last. Yeah, sure. I've heard that before. <laughs>
just had a listing go under contract that never made it to MLS or coming soon. Okay. My question is, am I able to put a sign in the yard showing under contract or no, since it's not sure. in MLS? Sure. Sure. Now, here's the thing. You're, you're not, uh, you're already under contract. It's yes. Not, it's not going to go in MLS? No. Okay. Yeah, you, you can do that. Now, you've got a listing agreement. And in the listing agreement, the seller has said, has made that choice, paragraph six in there, that it's not going to MLS uh, as you work through the process. Right. We have a form that that seller needed oh. to have signed off on, pre-market advisory. Okay. Where the seller accepts an offer before it fully goes on the market, they need to understand that they may have accepted something for less than what they could have gotten if it fully gone on the market. Yes, they did sign the pre-market. I'll have to- Okay, good, good. Check. I'll have to double check about the MLS status in the uh, listing agreement because our intent at, at the time of, of getting that signed was to put it in MLS. Okay. So, so if they if that didn't get addressed, do I need to go back and amend the listing agreement and ask them to well, sign? Yeah, you, you would, although frankly, if it's a reasonably good comp, I would encourage you to go ahead and put it in MLS, put it in as active and then sold, or okay. active, active and then pending. So we've got that comp sitting there. That'd be a better thing to do, and that way you've got no problem at all with signs. Great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Any other fine Zoom folks here? We got Cindy and Megan with their little conference. They got a meeting, and that's okay. You, you, you're sovereign. Yeah, I was telling her about the options. Is that really is a big deal to me? What, hey, what way? I, I need to so that's automatically accredited? Yeah. Yeah. So my seller never really gets the money. Never. Well, he can by requesting it from the title company. And, and as soon as the title company has cleared it as good funds, make sure it's cleared the bank then the title company can give it to the seller. And, and in paragraph five, the title company has that ability and they don't need a buyer's permission to do it. So that can be done, but it's going to take the seller requesting it. So if the seller never requests it, then the seller never gets that money. No, that's correct. Remember, the seller only gets the option fee really if the deal falls apart. No, I understand, but still it's... So if it closes, seller has to give the money back at closing. I know that. Well, but she didn't. No, I know, but I, she did. She knew that. I was just saying that's that's like a really big thing to me. Well, I'm thinking when you're on the seller side, then what's the effect on the seller side? I'm not going to get the money other than if it falls through. I'm like I'm kind of like pros and cons. Like, why would you want an option period as a seller? The whole reason for a seller getting the option fee is to be paid for that buyer's right to terminate during that time frame. The seller is receiving that, uh, and, he, and he, the buyer is literally purchasing it, so the seller does receive it. But because of the language in that paragraph, the seller also agrees, yeah, I get that money, it's my money, but if we close, I got to give it back. I mean, you're going to get credit to the sales price. And that's a choice that's made. It's an automatic choice in the new language, as Cindy points out, uh, that you work through it. So, you know, the seller may say, you know what, given what I know now, option fee is not all a big deal. I mean, what do I really care in fact, when a buyer is making offers in a multiple offer situation, uh, the only time they should look at the option fee as being a, a determinant is if it's not going to be credited, which is going to take language and special provisions. Oh, uh, so why would you want to not credit? Because if, if and we, we've got this right now, one of our buyers, and it's, gonna, it's not going to be a good situation, but anyway, put up too much of an option fee. Put up a thousand dollars. I had several of those <laughs> and I had a two thousand and option. not credited. What the buyer just said to the seller: "This is a bribe. If you'll accept my offer and get in contract with me, here's a thousand dollars. Go to Vegas, have a nice day." That's what the buyer is saying to the seller. If it's not credited, because you had that choice in in the old contracts, new contract, you're gonna have to actually put that in special provision. But that's why a buyer would do that. Is there? They're literally increasing the seller's net. Literally, more here's more money in your pocket, and it's more money in your pocket right now. So, go to lunch, have a good day, go to Vegas. Do you recommend that? Here's the here's the problem, and and I'm going to create a new form. Oh, good. For these specific situations, when a buyer makes 
And ludicrous is a good word. <laughs> Makes a ludicrous offer that has all kinds of risk and all kinds of challenges. I need to say, you understand, you agree, here are all these risks. Here's all the money you could be losing. Uh, I mean, this thousand dollars actually is gone. Uh, you know, you got all these challenges here. You know, your contingencies are limited or maybe none at all, like in your example. You need to understand the risk you've agreed to. So when later this thing goes south, don't fuss at us. You have made a choice. And buyers, because they're desperate now, are making choices and getting into con. Their obligation, their, their, their goal is no longer the house. It's a house. They can just get me into contract on any house. I just want, and what's happening is they're in a contract on multiple houses. Yes. And then deciding which one they really want to do. I think some people's personalities, and then you talk about the DISC or the DISC, some people's personalities make it to a day when it's more than once. They're just like, hell yeah, that they're going to win. <laughs> yeah. Out, oh, yeah. And they don't think about it until later. Yeah. I think buyer's remorse more so than. Oh, a lot of it, because we're seeing a lot of terminations early on during the option period, a lot of them. You're exactly right. And, and, do what? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're That's working on that. CYA. I told you if you said yes. Yeah, and it's just like the inner the internal listing right. thing. I've got four forms that we'll have for that. I've, I've completed four? well, one, the pre-market advisory form. Okay, yeah. So I have, have that. Second, I've got a certification for confidential information form. If the listing agent, buyers, buyers agent, you sign off saying you're gaining access to information uh, and, and you need to know this is confidential and hear the provisions and so forth. Um, and then a fourth form, a third form, we need to give to the buy, to the seller saying, you know, we're going to put your listing in this internet internal exclusive to our office. You've already made the decision in the listing agreement for it's not to go in MLS. And that was a choice in the listing agreement. And you need to understand here is the manner in which we're going to provide this information to our agents and potential buyers. But here's the risk. And this is also new language in the Texas Realtor Listing Agreement. If one of these buyers doesn't do what they're supposed to do, and all of a sudden, oh, that's a great hat. Let's tell everybody, put it on, let's put it on social media. If that happens and all of a sudden this property is publicly marketed, it's got to go in MLS. And that's what you've agreed to in the, so it's kind of a little bit of an advisory to the seller. Hey, here's what we're going to do. This why it's to plus is your advantage, but here's the risk as you work through that. Um, is there any form for the buyer? Well, it's the access form. Yes. The access form is going to both be for the listing agent, seller, buyer's agent, and the buyer. Okay. And they'll all sign off on it. Okay. Okay. I real quickly want to elaborate on what I said. I know that the buyer had the right to terminate but what the situation I was in was I had the seller divorce, moved out of the house. We had no buyer for the house because of our mistake. Oh, okay. We had made the mistake. I made okay. a mistake and a mistake okay. on the HOA. So the only way I need to do to do it is stay out of court. <laughs> yeah. up my commission. We like to stay out of court. And I did. Okay. And you know what? When we closed, we closed with John Edwards over years ago. Only got two years ago. Yeah, years ago. No, John Wayne. And when we walked out, he said, "I want to, I want to ask you something or tell you something." I thought. Yeah, but uh, he said, "I want to commend you on your professionalism. You did it. You made a mistake. You did the remedy that you thought would help the most." And I would recommend you to anybody. <laughs> and I went home and I was going, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, Love and it. it was, it was true, totally more of a mistake. Okay, Zoom folks. Uh, thank, you, any, thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, thank the Zoom folks for being here. Any last minute questions you guys have? Anything that you guys have? Anything to Zoom people? Thank you everybody very, very much. Uh, no further, this uh, meeting is adjourned. Even as an old-time agent here, when I come to your classes, I learn. Oh, and so do I. Yes. I learn in every class we do. I'm going to make it my goal this year to be almost all of them. I love coming to these. Are you going to let me come in person yeah. all the time? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. I, I love more and more of the live folks. I love it. Okay, so, uh, Cindy? Yes, sir. Will you need help with the scroller in here? Yeah, because I, I need to uh, close. Do you need a? Oh, yeah, you just I need to close. Click the X. Yeah. What? He, yeah, just you just need to click it, don't you? Yeah. I don't know. You mean, this one right here. I want to leave. There you oh, go. was it up there? Okay, I see it now. Uh,
Uh,